Uh, welcome to season three of BizHack Live. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy, a training academy dedicated to helping small business owners learn how to market themselves online. Today we have an, an incredible treat. Uh, we're going to be having uh, Jack Killian talking about good old-fashioned networking for business growth, how to turn your contacts into sales. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Jack here in a second. Uh, I did want to acknowledge um, that uh, that Jack is actually uh, was recommended to us uh, by one of our previous speakers, Richard Shapiro. Richard, thank you for coming today, and I'm so grateful for you bringing Jack into my life. And um, I'm excited today to talk about what some might call traditional marketing, uh, but also sort of with the view of how to translate that into the technological, digital, and post-COVID world or COVID world. Uh, so we're going to really explore how networking works in a time when we can't see each other safely. Um, as many of you have already joined, uh, we do offer a season pass. Uh, this will give you access to both free and paid webinars that are part of our BizHack Live series. You will also get, uh, after every webinar, whether you attend or not, uh, a copy of the presentation and a link to the recording. This is something we reserve for folks who either attend in person uh, or who, um, uh, who are part of our season pass. And so uh, we, we have an incredible lineup of great content coming up. Uh, and if you want to, if you're not always able to make it in person, but you want to make sure you don't miss it, please do okay. sign up for the BizHack Live. This is a, uh, you know, the BizHack Live is something that we do for the community. Uh, it's a way to support uh, this community that has supported us so much. And uh, you, this is a way for you to give your thanks back. So thank you for those of you who signed up for our season pass. You can go to BizHack Season Pass 2021 at Eventbrite. Uh, dot eventbrite.com if you're interested. Um, I wanted to also acknowledge our partners who have helped uh, really take uh, BizHack Live to the next level, the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association, the American Marketing Association, uh, South Florida chapter, and Miami Marketers. These are all organizations that are about helping promote and push marketing in the digital world, and we're very grateful to have them as our sponsors. Finally, uh, I want to talk about the amazing Jack Killian. Jack is an advisor to thousands of entrepreneurs and business leaders talking about uh, networking IQ or what he calls NQ. And uh, a lot of you probably took the NQ test. Jack's going to talk a little bit about what he saw in our results and how each of us rank in our networking. I thought I was a good networker and then I took that uh, assessment, Jack, and now I'm not so sure. Jack is also a serial entrepreneur and he has used, uh, he's grown nine businesses across the world. He's also the author of Network All the Time, Everywhere with Everybody, Master Your Life and Career. I love that title. It pretty much speaks for itself. And we're going to get a real taste of some of the biggest takeaways from Jack and his years uh, and expertise in networking. Finally, he has um, degrees from Yale Community College and MIT. Uh, and spent two decades as an adjunct professor at three business schools. Jack, I didn't see you laugh when I called it Yale Community College. No, I thought, God, maybe maybe I had it wrong. <laughs> I went to Princeton. I can't let that one go, my friend. I'm sorry. No, I thought you know something I don't know. Yeah, you know, the, the what we, we used to say at Princeton is Harvard sucks and Yale doesn't matter. <laughs> So over to you, my friend. I'm very looking forward to this. Okay. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate everybody uh, coming to this. I appreciate the opportunity to share my thinking on a topic. That, uh, excuse me, one minute. I got to let the dog in. Excuse me. <laughs> no problem. Um, so while... Uh, he's doing that. Uh, I can talk a little bit about um, who we have coming up next. Um, we're going to be talking about um, some of the top tips for digital marketing uh, next week. Uh, I'll give you guys a little bit more information before we wrap up today, but just in a really exciting lineup of folks. Um, and, and Jack is, is a fabulous speaker. All right, back to you, Jack. I'm back. The bulldog is in. Great.
All right. So anyway, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, you know, in an hour, I can't te show you or teach you all the things that I've learned about networking. So uh, I'm going to do the best I can to hit some of the highlights. So let me begin by sharing my screen. Everybody see that okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so the, the focus of the discussion today, and I like to make this as interactive as we can, but the focus is on networking for business success, and more specifically, how do you turn your contacts into sales? And I'm doing this under the umbrella of uh, my latest new venture, which is called Street Smart Entrepreneurs. The website is streetsmartentrepreneurs.com. And I launched this company about six months ago when I really started thinking about COVID-19 and what are going to be the good things that come out of it. You know, we're going through a lot of horrible things, but I think there are going to be some important good things that emerge from the COVID-19 experience one of which is, I think, going to be an explosion in entrepreneurship worldwide. And I want to be part of that. I want to try to help entrepreneurs worldwide uh, and make a difference in the success that they achieve. And we're going to be doing that by developing online courses for entrepreneurs, by doing strategic consulting, by running different types of webinars. So if anybody would like to uh, be kept up to date, on the things that we're doing, just uh, shoot me an email at, at that address, which and you'll see that at the end of the presentation. So my goal today, as I said, I can't get into the real nitty gritty about some of the ways I go about networking, but I wanna get you to drink the Kool-Aid and recognize that successful networking in my mind is as important as reading, writing, and arithmetic. You know, I think every kid in school should be taught these skills. They are difference-making skills. I think from uh, the point of view of this audience, these, these skills are critical for driving sales results, for boosting the overall success of the organization that you're with, for accelerating your, your personal career. And a point that a lot of people miss about networking is that as you get really good at this, you can have an enormous impact on the quality of life of the people that you care about and your family and your friends. And I, I could get into all kinds of examples of how my networking has really impacted my family, you know, and vice versa, how their networking has impacted my life. So you're, you're here to learn to drink the Kool-Aid. My networking background, I come from a very blue collar family. Uh, neither parent graduated from, from high school. I was very fortunate to be the first one in the family to go to a college. I went to Yale for an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, and there I did no networking. I then immediately went on to the MIT Business School at Sloan, and there I also did almost no networking. While I was at MIT, I started uh, taking courses at the Harvard Business School, uh, with an expectation I might get my PhD, which I never uh, followed through on. But at the Harvard Business School, I essentially did no networking. My first job out of MIT, I graduated one morning and I was recruited by a British technology company to go to London to help them set up an internal management consulting group. And with that company, Elliott Automation, I, did, I started to do a little bit of, uh, of networking uh, and then when I came back to the States, I joined McKinsey, a company I think very high love in the, highly of in the management consulting space. And there I also did almost uh, no networking. So if you look at that period of like 10 years, it, you know, the, the weird thing that I have to confess is that I didn't stay in touch with any of the amazing people that I met in any of those amazing organizations. And I can't imagine how different my life would be 
if I had been smart enough to realize the importance of networking and, and practice getting better at it. So I was clueless up until about 30. And then two simultaneous t- decisions that I made forced me to start the network. Uh, I was doing really well at McKinsey, uh, at least from the point of view of the senior management there. And they started talking to me one day about nominating me as a partner at the end of the year, which would have been several years ahead of the normal curve. And I went back up to my office and I was working late and I just didn't have enough confidence that I uh, would really be an effective partner at McKinsey. So I called home to tell my wife I was working late and I told her, I just made two decisions. And she said, what are they? I said, we're going to buy a racehorse. And she understood that because I was very interested in racing. And she said, what else? I said, I'm going to quit my job. And she said, when? I said, tomorrow. And she said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. But I did follow through. The next morning I went down and I talked to the partner that had talked to me about becoming a partner. And I, I told him, you know, I just wasn't convinced that's what I should do. And rather than let them think that's what I wanted to do, I thought I should leave and find another path. And it took me three or four months to disengage from uh, from McKinsey, but I eventually left. And my first venture really forced me to start to network. And back then, this is 100 years ago, you know, people didn't talk about networking. There were no groups that you could go to. There were no networking uh meetup type of groups. There was nothing on any internet. So I started absolutely cold turkey. I had a vision to help entrepreneurs fund and grow their businesses, but I was starting out with no experience doing that, no track record doing that, and no business plan. Uh, I had no safety net. You know, I hadn't saved up a bunch of cash to do this. I had no other revenue stream. I didn't have any viable, relevant contacts. I didn't have any client, either client companies looking to raise money or client investors looking to put money into deals. I had no office space, no business cards, no stationery, obviously no internet access. I had nobody helping me and I had very poor communication skills at the time. So I I either had to fish or cut bait and I had to force myself to start meeting people And I did that by uh, commuting into New York every day from uh, where I lived in New Jersey with a pocket full of change and going to Grand Central or Penn Station Railroad and getting on the pay phones and cold calling people. And I absolutely hated it. If a person didn't pick up their phone in three rings, I would thank God and hang up and like I had accomplished something. So I absolutely started totally cold with no ability in networking no real appreciation of how important it was, but I but I got through it. And my networking has only been getting better ever since. You know, I think I'm still getting better today. I'm always thinking of new ways, new ideas. Uh, along the way, in the last 45 plus years, I've started and grown uh, 10 new ventures. I'm on my 10th one now. I've evaluated thousands of deals. Most of them are lousy. Uh, I've really gotten to be pretty good at analyzing proposed new ventures or early stage companies. I've advised literally thousands of clients, uh, globally thousands of clients. I've served on multiple corporate boards, both private and public companies, and I've served on several charity boards. So I've really built up a, a wealth of experiences working with a whole range of different types of people. The uh, 10 companies that I started, I spent a total of, so I estimate a total of over 83 man years to date on these startups because I'm usually doing more than one at a time. At, at my absolute crazy busiest, I was running four separate companies at the same time. My first venture was KBO, which uh, stood for the names of me and my two partners that I add it like a year after I started. That was a venture capital type of firm. That spun off into starting Country Music Magazine, the first national country music magazine in America. And then later on in my career, I also started 
the first magazine in the wireless mobile communication space, which was called Wireless for the Corporate User. Uh, my dad passed away when I was in the middle of country music and uh, he died on a Saturday. I went down to his office Saturday afternoon. I had not been involved in the company. I went through his desk. I saw how bad it was, called his accountant, met with them on Sunday and started trying to turn around the company on Monday while at the same time I was running a couple of magazines in New York City. And I spent a total of 16 years on killing extruders. Uh, I bought a farm, walnut farm in New Jersey to go into the racehorse breeding and training business. I did that for 20 years. I did that overlapping with part of country music and part of killing extruders. I then with one of the partners in killing extruders uh, developed a three-man partnership in Florida to do real estate development, which we did for five years until my two partners in Florida got into a uh, tiff between them and broke up the partnership. I then moved on to uh, starting an investment fund and a hedge fund called Somerset Investment Group, which morphed into a fund of funds called Eagle Rock Diversified Fund. And I spent 20 years in total on those two funds. And when I shut down Eagle Rock Diversified Fund for some personal health issues, I spent the next four or five years with the Jack Killian group doing coaching on various topics and consulting with uh, a couple of select clients. I spent about five years doing that. And I've spent the last six months launching Street Smart Entrepreneurs. So I've been in a lot of different situations, uh, all of which really helped me hone my networking skills. Just to put some, a picture to, the, uh, to a couple of the titles, this is the first uh, cover of Country Music Magazine that we published. It was a cover featuring Johnny Cash. Uh, in, the, in the second year of Country Music Magazine, uh, we were rated the second fastest growing consumer magazine in America. This is a winning picture of the first horse that I owned winning the first race I ever won. And over the years, I personally have been involved in uh, delivering over a hundred baby horses all of which I went on to train myself at the track. So I'm very hands-on in everything I do. Some, uh, some of the things that I've sold using networking, I've obviously sold investments in client deals and for my own ventures. I've sold entire companies to people that I found through my networking efforts. When I was in the magazine business, I sold lots of advertising, lots of sponsorships, lots of other media products. I sold racehorses when I was in the uh, racing business, which I've been out of for about 10 years now. I sold uh, multi-million dollar investments in our two hedge funds. I've sold a range of coaching and consulting services. I've sold real estates, I've sold concepts, I've sold memberships and things, I've sold events, and I've sold grants to different uh, grant uh, sources. So I've used networking in a wide variety of selling situations. W what is networking? Well, to me, networking is something that everybody does it. Everybody starts out, they're bo you're born into a network, that's your family. So you you're beginning from day one to learn to uh, adjust to people, like people, have people like you, build relationships, communicate. So Everybody networks. Don't think that uh, I'm anything special. I may do a little bit more of it than some of you. I may be a little bit better at it than some of you, but I'm sure there are people sitting in on this uh, session that are even uh, better at it than I am and do more of it than I do. In your life, if you live to be about 80, you're going to meet three about 300,000 people. So one part of networking is meeting all these people, deciding which ones you want to maintain contact and build relationships with. So you're constantly prioritizing. And then with some of them, you want to begin to develop an ongoing relation. So I, I've still got a few relationships that go back 40 or 50 years that still bear fruit. So, you know, you got to, you got to cherry pick who you're going to stay in touch with. And I think your real focus when you network should be on adding value uh, to the other people that you 
begin to develop a relationship and don't worry about keeping score. I, I think we have somebody on this discussion this morning that is concerned about, you know, they don't always get a benefit from the effort they put into networking. Well, I don't think you can worry about keeping score. This is not, you know, what I do for you, you do for me. I think if you really want to be great at this, you got to focus on adding value to the people that you're that you're developing a relationship with. And I think networking is really about gaining access and acquiring knowledge. It's not just about acquiring new uh, personal relationships. So everybody does it to some extent. I'm just encouraging you to think about how to do it better. Uh, many of you took the networking assessment uh, that Dan uh, sent out. Uh, and I went through and I reviewed the results and the re results are better than the average uh, that I see when people take our assessment, which, which doesn't surprise me because uh, just because of the fact that you showed up at this event means you're interested in networking, which indicates you're probably doing it. Uh, I know that many of you are entrepreneurs with your own businesses and you wouldn't have gotten to uh, today's meeting if you were not semi-skilled or quite skilled at networking. So the, uh, the skill level in this group is above what I normally see. And 77% of the ones that I collected up until yesterday are in the average or above average. And nobody is in the barely a pulse uh, category. And I've had results down as low as a five in one case uh, from a person working in a major accounting firm. Uh, and I very seldom see people up in the terrific category, maybe uh, four or five percent of the people who take our assessment. So kudos to this group for being uh, quite good at your skill level. I, I visualize networking as opening doors into the lives and careers of the people that I meet. And if you approach it that way, you know, like there's I don't know how many people are on this call today let's say there's 30 or 40 or 50. Um, but I view that as we begin to develop a relation, I'm gonna walk through the door to your life and your career. And I'll begin to learn all about the things that you learn and know. I'll begin to be, have access to your contacts and to your ideas. So this is a very cost-effective way to leverage your time in developing expertise and new relationships. Networking, to me, it's not hard, it's not trivial, it's not disruptive or time-consuming, and if, and if we had more time on this call, I'd give you example after example of how networking has saved me major blocks of time, and I'm talking about months of time, not just a couple of minutes of time, so it's not disruptive or time-consuming, and it's certainly not primarily going to events exchanging business cards and hoping something happens. And it's something, and it's not, if you do it well, it's not something that I think is gonna produce instant results. I have my own one year rule for accomplishing anything significant. I think it, it generally takes a year for anything significant to develop from the time you start. So from the time I meet some of you today, it'll be a year before we really figure out what our synergies are what we might accomplish together, get that underway. So, you know, starting Street Smart Entrepreneurs, I'm six months into it. Uh, it's gonna be at least a year before that really begins to uh, develop a strong head of steam. When we were breeding and training racehorses from the time I would decide what stallion to send the mare to, to the time we had the baby up and, up and standing, that generally was 11 or 12 months. So anything significant, I think takes a year and you gotta be patient with your networking efforts. There's a lot of various ways to network, which I could get into in detail, which I do get into detail on the networking course that Street Smart is uh, developing. You can network randomly, which I certainly encourage everybody to do. And you can network by targeting, by randomly networking. I mean, talk to everybody you meet with. So when I pull into a gas station and fill it up, I start talking to the guy pumping gas. And if he has happens to have an interesting accent, I, I find out where he's from and what brought him to America and what are the big differences and does he go back often? 
uh, this morning I had a, a doctor's appointment uh, with a doctor I had never met before. And by the time I left, I, I knew that she had gone to Rutgers undergraduate, Seton Hall graduate, she had taught at Seton Hall. So just you're there, you're not taking any incremental time when you bump into new people. That's how you get to meet 300,000 people in your lifetime. Take advantage of random encounters and talk to people. You can certainly network at events. You can network in groups, membership groups like the Rotary Club or the Chamber of Commerce or Santa. And of course, uh, in these days, you can do massive amounts of networking on social media. And I'm encouraging you to make networking part of your daily routine. Just build it into the fabric of the way you live your life. And I think you should be teaching your family members these skills. When our son was about 12 years old, I got him his first business cards because Jonathan was a very good golfer, always has been good. We would take him and drop him off at a golf course and he'd have no way to stay in touch with the people he met. So I said, Jonathan, you need to have a business card. And he was intimidated. He didn't want a business card. But after a while, he got very comfortable with it. And now Jonathan is a really skilled networker. So let's, let's talk about networking and sales. It's obviously easier to sell the people you know. It's obviously easier to sell the people who search you out versus you chasing. So part of my philosophy about business development is find ways to attract potential buyers to you. And again, there's lots of ways to do that. You can do that by giving speeches like I'm giving today, by writing and publishing materials, by organizing events, creating groups, you know, doing surveys. But I, I view it like chumming. So you want to get people coming to you as opposed to you having to chase people. You'll, you'll have a lot easier time selling to people who like you, know you, and trust you. And you'll have an easier time selling to previous versus new customers. These are all obvious. You'll, it's easier to sell to people that have been referred to you, that you're already uh, being sort of blessed with a trusted indication. And it's easier to sell to people that you correctly target. I find a lot of people trying to sell things really haven't I clearly identified who is the right best prospect for what they're selling. I, I see that all the time in entrepreneurial situations. I even see it in bigger companies. Uh, when you're trying to sell something, it's easier to sell something if it involves a win-win where you're both getting something out of the trans transaction. I'll give you a few examples of that. And it's also important, this is motherhood, but it's important that you sell something that's important that has real value. Uh, I see some people, including people in this discussion, I think this morning, who are trying to build their own company, selling a product or a service that is of marginal value. It's not gonna be a difference maker to anybody's career or career or life. So make certain that what you're trying to sell is a win-win for the other par party and make certain it's really significant with real high value impact. Let's talk a little bit about cold calling. Nobody likes to do it. I think uh, the three key reasons to cold call people is if you have an urgent need, that means where there's a time pressure on you to get something done. So I, I consider that at, at this stage of my life, I don't buy any green bananas because I don't know how far down the road, I'm going to be around to let the bananas ripe. So if I have a, a sales situation that has a time limit on it, I can't afford to buy green bananas. I got to pick up the phone or email or do something and make a cold call. Uh, this works best if, if your need is really important, not only for you, but for the other side of the uh, transaction. And I'm going to give a couple of examples after this slide. And cold call, it was no other obvious way to connect. So when I started KBO, my venture capital raising firm, I had no, no contacts to reach out to. So I was forced uh, to teach myself to begin to cold call people. And I recognize that we all hate doing it. I'm not saying it's easy, but sometimes I'm saying it's the only way. So what are some of the successes that I've had selling different things? I raised $500,000 uh, in equity to start Country Music Magazine 
by cold calling a company in Minneapolis. I read an article in the New York Times that Harper's Magazine was in trouble. Harper's is the oldest consumer magazine in America. And um, I decided that we needed to raise the money for Country Music Magazine. I was gonna call the owners of Harper's and see if uh, my little three-man firm could put together a deal to get involved in turning around Harper's. But the owners of Harper's, which was a, mag a newspaper chain, would have to put up $500,000 in equity to start Country Music Magazine. I made that call and we got that deal done. I also raised 90% of the funding to buy our 50 acre walnut farm uh, with a cold call. Uh, I helped grow Killian Extruders globally by making a cold call to the Department of Commerce. I raised $2 million of uh, grant money from the uh, US Department of Energy in Washington for Stevens Institute at the time I was involved with Stevens Institute in Hoboken. Then the president asked me if I could help him raise some grant money. I've had meetings with three presidents, President Nixon, Carter, and Obama, which all started by reaching out cold to President Nixon. And then, uh, you know, just to, at the lower end of things, I cold called a pitching coach at the Yankees when our son Jonathan was 12 years old and a very good little league baseball player and asked the pitching coach if he would be willing to meet with Jonathan and share pitching tips with him. So to me, that was an important goal. And, and Jonathan was on vacation. I wanted to make this happen when he got back from vacation. So there was a time pressure uh, to get it done. And uh, we got to meet Russ Myers, the Yankee pitching coach. And he stayed in touch with Jonathan for four or five years until he passed away. Uh, what are some of the reasons people don't network to sell, don't network successfully to sell? First of all, you can blame your mother because she was the one who started telling you at a very early age, uh, don't talk to strangers. Well, here's Jack, you know, many years, many decades later, telling you to talk to everybody everywhere all the time. Most people, no matter how successful they are, I find, really don't understand the value of networking, so they don't do it. They never learned, they never took the time to learn or think about it. So they don't know how to do it really effectively. And a lot of, too many people lack a real sense of curiosity and a real ability to spot opportunities. I think if you start thinking about spotting opportunities, maybe keep a notebook and jot ideas down every day of new opportunities, you'll see, you'll, you'll be astounded that you'll see opportunities every day. And if you're in a selling situation, spotting new opportunities is something you need to be good at. Some people don't do it because they have personal hangups. They're shy or they're introverted, or they just don't have much interest or like people and think that they don't have time. And I, I put this uh, frowning figure over here because I think the excuse of not having time is about the lousiest one anybody can ha have. Because if you're not willing to invest time in meeting people and developing relationships that will enrich your life, enrich your career, boost the growth of your company, and impact your family, I, I don't know what better way you have of spending time. So what are some keys to successful networking? First of all, I think you have to have a genuine interest in meeting people, building a relationship, adding value to them and learning from them. Uh, I think you need to be really motivated to focus on building relationships versus doing transactions. I, I see a lot of professional service providers uh, that I've worked with in the past. I've worked with you know, the three top accounting firms in the industry. I've worked with major US and national law firms. And too often I find that their focus is on doing a successful transaction. It might be a, a, a tax return or an audit or a contract or a lease. I, I think professional service providers, the real business they're in should be on helping their clients thrive. And if they approach their sales situation with that mentality, I think they would see their business boom. I think this is something that you get better at as you practice 
So one of the advantages of uh, networking randomly is there's no risk. It's not time consuming. Uh, there's no real downside to it. And you get just get better at communicating with people, breaking the ice, asking questions quickly, focusing on what's important in the five minute discussion. I think you also have to, when you meet people, focus 90% on them, the conversation. You already know everything there is to know about you. So you don't need to hear yourself talking about your college background or your career. Get them talking, ask good questions. And what you're looking for, I think networking is like rock climbing. You're trying to find finger holes where you have synergy with the other person that you can capitalize on and begin to develop a relationship that'll lead to you closing sales. And finally, I think you should be a giver, which I've been emphasizing. I think there are four types of networkers. The lowest one on the rung is somebody who just constantly asks for things, contacts, referrals, uh, closed sales. There are other people who are taker. If I do something for, for them, they'll take it and maybe thank me, but that's the end of it. And there are some other people who will horse trade with me. If I do something for them, they'll try to do something for me. But by far the best type of networker is just focus on adding value to the people that are in your life and in your career. I wanted to pause really quickly and ask you a quick question. You know, the word the use of the word thrive, uh, you know, helping people thrive really caught my ear because, you know, my why is that I love supporting the underdog or championing the underdog so they can thrive. That's, that's what um, motivates me, motivated me throughout my life, certainly motivates me every yep. day at BizHack. Yep. And it seems to me like you've probably done a study of what it means to help someone thrive. And so I'm really curious if you wouldn't mind just digging in to what, how do you help someone thrive, Jack? Uh, it, I haven't done a study, but it ranges all over the place. It, it starts with me uh, counseling high school kids on getting into the college that is a really good fit for them. It, it goes on to me working with college kids, uh, helping them think through how to uh, find a first career opportunity. It includes me helping people who have lost their jobs because of COVID, finding ways to create new opportunities for themselves. It, or it might help a client company find an acquisition or a merger candidate or find a new person to join their management team or find a, a better uh, financial advisor to help them manage their assets. So, you know, every individual, there are different ways you can have an impact on, on them and help them in their ability to really thrive both personally and, and professionally. So I think as you're building these relationships, you need not to look at things in silos. I think you need to look at things in a very integrated way. So hopefully I'll get to meet some of the people on this call at some point in the near future. And I wanna be getting to understand them personally. What are their personal goals and objectives and hurdles? What are their professional ones? And you know, the more I learn about somebody, uh, the better job I can do of trying to have an impact and without worrying about what I get out of it because you know, I get a lot out of doing that type of thing. I've learned things first. It gets my mind engaged, gets me thinking. And, and sometimes, you know, the person has a way to add to whatever I'm trying to accomplish. Right now, I'm trying to get in front of uh, entrepreneurs and educate them about street smart entrepreneurs. So, you know, thriving can mean different things at different points. When, when I was in the horse race business, thriving me meant to... Uh, have a very high percentage of uh, live foals get to the races and have a very high percentage of winning races and in the money finishes. So thriving depends on the situation and on the people. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. No, it's, it's um, you know, what, what I love is this notion of a finger hold, the analogy of, you know, searching for literally anything you can grab a hold of and provide value. So in a sense, when you're a giver, what you really are is you're asking questions to find opportunities to help. 
Right. And, and, and th those finger holds are really about providing value. And if you are in a mentality of, I'm gonna do everything I can in these five minutes to find uh, an opportunity to provide value to this person, Yep. Um, that seems to me the way you can help someone thrive. Like that basically means you're just giving of them uh, selflessly whatever you have to offer. Right. Absolutely. And that often that often, not always, but often will allow them to thrive. Right. Uh, I, I've given quite a few uh, talks at college campuses and I often get asked by the young students, you know, I'm only a freshman or a sophomore, what, what can I possibly add value to somebody who's the CEO of a Fortune 500 company? And I said, you know, don't, don't underestimate yourself. I said, do you know any good Italian restaurants you can recommend? Or have you read any good books recently you could recommend? Or have you and your family been on a vacation or maybe for a weekend getaway and you found some particularly good place? Or have you played golf at a really interesting course recently? I said, everybody has the ability to add value to other people. Don't underestimate yourself. And the, yeah. too many of these young people just don't think like that. They underestimate their ability to have an impact on people. Absolutely. You know, we have a couple of questions I wanted to run through. I just, what you're saying reminds me of one of the best networkers in all of South Florida, Dave Lawrence, um, former publisher of the Miami Herald, uh, now the head uh, founder of the Children's Trust and the Children's Movement of Florida. Uh, and um, he always asks people, what book are you reading right now? Um, yep. And everybody who meets with him knows they better have that book ready. Uh, and then he often will tell them about a book that he thinks relevant to them. And not, uh, not, uh, it's not unusual a couple of days later to receive that book he recommended. So, um, it, you know, he has the deepest Rolodex of anyone I've ever met. And he always starts by talking about, like, what are you reading right now? And he used to say that he reads a book a week. Uh, so uh, so he, he's a prolific reader, runs book clubs and so forth. So Jennifer Gettinger talked about growing up in South Florida, where we're sort of taught to be guarded and not to bother people. Uh, I can also imagine anyone who's driven in South Florida and then compare that to driving another place knows that we're not always very friendly to one another. So her question is, how do you get over that cultural challenge? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand the question. But... So let me let me rephrase. Yeah. Um, Growing up in South Florida, we've been raised to be guarded and not to bother people. We don't have a small town feeling, so it can be challenging. How do we get over that cultural challenge? Yep. When I, when I uh, wrote my book on networking, I had a, a woman in the Midwest edit the book, and she took exception to one of the ideas that I, I put in the book. And the idea was that I often involve my family in my networking meetings. If I'm meeting somebody for breakfast at a local diner, I have no hesitation of asking my son or my wife if they want to come along, depending on the meeting, they may have to sit in a separate booth after I introduce them, or if the meeting is appropriate, they can join the meeting. Um, and she said, you know, that wouldn't work in the Midwest. I said, I think it will work any place in the world. So I think the things I'm talking about now will work any place. I think people are really, really uh, interested in meeting new people. They may not take the initiative. So one of the things, to, if you want to be a really good networker, you got to take the initiative and recognize that cultures or people's habits uh, prevent them from reaching out and being the, uh, the initiator of a new relationship. I mean, uh, I've had successful networking experiences with uh, people from all parts of the world where the culture is totally different than it is here in Metro New York. So I think you should give yourself more credit um, that being a decent human being and having a genuine interest in people is gonna be something that's welcome any place you go. Fabulous, thank you. Audrey Salazar asked, what advice would you give to women to network and maintain safety with relation to your gas station story? Uh, I think uh, I've spent a lot of time coaching women networking. 
a lot of women are leery about networking with guys. And amazingly, some guys are leery about networking with women. So, you know, it's a two-way thing. I, I think uh, for women to network safely and securely uh, depends a little bit on where the, when you're meeting in person, depends a little bit on where you're meeting and what time of the day you're meeting. So later on, I'll be talking about how, how I'm a big believer in networking over breakfast as opposed to lunch or dinner or drinks. You know, certainly meeting somebody for an hour at the local diner is a pretty risk-free way to meet somebody new, whether it's a guy or a woman. Um, so, you know, you got to be careful about where you meet them, when you meet them. You know, I better, I'll, I'll get into my form of networking later, but, you know, I, I find that most guys aren't really interested in hitting on other women. Uh, I'm finding that I'm getting approached more and more by women on LinkedIn and and they're finding me and reaching out because they see something in my background that may be of value to them where maybe I could really be a new resource. So I, I think, um, you know, it's an important question. And with all the uh, sexual abuse going on in companies, you obviously have to be careful, but, you know, pay attention to where you meet, what time of the day you meet, uh, how long you meet, and maybe take somebody along with you to a meeting. So sometimes when I meet with women, I, I take Judy along because I know they, they will be interested in her track record and the things that she's done. And they'll be more comfortable meeting both of us as opposed to just meeting some chubby old guy. So I don't know whether I answered the question, but those are my thoughts. Keep going. Let me keep going. Some of the other keys to successful networking are uh, targeting the right people. I, I mentioned that in the past that I'll get to this in a little bit more detail in a minute. And I think if you're in a selling situation, you gotta have very specific goals. And you, you start out by defining your goals and then identifying who are the people that can help you accomplish your sales goal. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. I think you have to be constantly expanding your networking clusters. And I use the word clusters because most people don't recognize the concept that, they're, that the people they know are in clusters. You have clusters of contacts from your community. You have clusters of contacts from your high school days, from your college days, from previous jobs you've had, from your current job, from your church, from the clubs you belong to. And if you really break down your network in quotes down into clusters and start to think about how many names you have in each of those clusters, you're gonna be surprised at how badly underestimating the scope of your network has been. And then I think you need to be spending time building your personal brand. Like I said, I would rather have potential customers coming to me than me chasing them. So I view building your brand as like chumming. So you can build your brand by trying to be published or by giving talks like this, or by joining various groups, industry groups, community groups, chambers of commerce, Rotary Club, uh, giving back to your community by serving on uh, charity boards. So you need to be building your personal brand that will attract potential prospects to you. You got to organize and update your database, which is something I've done a poor job at. So I'm just now catching up, building a, a MailChimp database for using to promote street smart entrepreneurs. You have to be a patient giver. I emphasize that. And then you have to do it your way. My, you know, you can't replicate networking the way I do it because I'm doing it so it fits into my lifestyle, my family's lifestyle my interests, my passions. So you got to figure out your way of doing it. And I'll show you my way of doing it. So selling via networking, define your goals, identify the right prospects, do your homework. I hate to begin a relationship with somebody who hasn't really taken time to uh, get to know me on paper, get to know the company I represent. So never try to get into a sales situation where you haven't done your homework and it happens way too often. 
do chumming, as I mentioned, find and use the best ways to connect, whether it's cold call, whether it's by email, instant messaging, uh, phone calls, uh, in-person visits. So there's lots of ways you got to pick the best way. And I've emphasized the importance of making certain you're selling something important and you're doing it in a win-win situation and focus on the person you're trying to sell to and building a relationship versus just doing a transaction. So if you're trying to sell something to me, take time and it's not gonna take a lot of time, but to learn about Jack the person, learn about what Jack is currently doing with Street Smart Entrepreneurs, what are some of my passions and interests? So you can begin to think about other ways uh, that we can benefit each other. That, that will greatly facilitate your ability to close sales. So a little over a year ago, I was retained by a community bank in New Jersey. Uh, they were shifting their business model and putting more emphasis on their branch managers to aggressively go build new revenue streams from local businesses. So when I sat with them, we came up with this little chart and I said, okay, you know, who, who really can help you do this? Maybe CPAs in the area you can meet with and they can begin, you know, what CPA firms could you meet with? And then what law firms or lawyers could you meet with in your community that could be sources of referrals? What marketing firms, let's name four of them. What corporate parks and the companies in them could you be uh, trying to build relationships with to get referrals? What community groups, whether it's Rotary Club or Vistage or Chambers of Commerce or Santa Club for women? So we put together this grid and this dictated the way these uh, branch managers then be started trying to generate business revenues by a very targeted networking approach. And it, and it worked. They had a significant boost that has been maintained in attracting new business clients just by identifying the goal and targeting who they were going to go after and then figuring out how to get to those people. Let me talk about how I network. This is the way I expect to network post-COVID-19. And my approach was different before COVID-19. Over on the left-hand side, and uh, I'm sure Dan will provide copies of these slides if anybody wants them for reference, but on the left-hand column, I, I list all the different ways that I might spend time with people. Breakfast meetings, lunch meetings, dinner meetings, uh, in between coffee meetings or drinks meetings, going to events, either my own events that I create or other events, uh, participating in group meetings like chambers or rotary clubs, and then social media, which is using you know Facebook or LinkedIn or email. And then I put down travel because travel is an important time consumer depending on how you spend your networking time. So post COVID-19, I estimate I'm gonna have about 75 breakfast meetings a year 10 lunch meetings a year, four or five dinner meetings at most, maybe three or four coffee meetings. I might go to six events. I might go to six group meetings, but I'm gonna be having, I estimate 1300 social media contacts post COVID-19, which means I'm gonna be meeting at least 1400 people in the, in the next 12 month period. Prior to COVID-19, my social media number was way, way down. These numbers stayed about the same. And my breakfast meetings probably were up around 280 to 300 breakfast meetings a year. Sometimes I would be having two breakfast meetings on the same day, including Saturdays or Sundays. Uh, so back in pre-COVID-19, my travel time was much more significant because I was going to many more of these meetings. Hours per year I spend on it. I expect to spend 75 hours a year at breakfast meetings post COVID-19. I'm gonna spend about 500 hours on social media. It's still about 200 hours in a car or on a train traveling. I'm gonna spend about $1,500 on breakfast meetings, assuming I pay for every one of them 
at about 10 bucks a head, 500 bucks for lunch, 400 bucks for dinner. So by far the biggest investment will be for breakfast meetings, uh, 260 bucks for gas mileage or train tickets. So I'm gonna be spending about $3,200 a year investing in my networking business development efforts. And before COVID-19, this number was closer to $10,000 because I had a much bigger number up here and a much bigger number down here. A um, couple questions. Uh, yeah. number, that's a fabulous uh, graphic. What about video calls or phone calls? I put all those under social media. Okay. I, I, I hate doing phone calls. I'm really awkward on the phone. If you look at my phone bill, you'll see any of the ones that I initiate are like three minutes or less. And that goes back to my old days of cold calling from Grand Central Station, where I had to keep calls short so the operator didn't come on and say deposit another 25 cents. So I'm not, I don't prefer to use phone, but I use a lot of uh, Zoom meetings. I think today I have four Zoom meetings. Uh, that might be kind of typical. So all phone, Zoom, you know, whatever, email, that's all in this number here. Got it. Um, it seems like breakfast is really what drives your efforts. Is that fair? Uh, that's what drove it before COVID-19. But I, I find, you know, I find Zoom meetings to be pretty effective. And they're, it's certainly not as good as in-person meetings. But I can certainly have the first meeting with people on Zoom. Like I had one with the head of a family office yesterday in Philadelphia. Prior to COVID-19, I would have driven down to Philadelphia to meet him because he was a relatively important new contact but we spent an hour on a Zoom call. Yeah. You know, and that accomplished about 80 or 90% of what I needed to get done to confirm that, you know, it would be worth investing in more time in that relationship. So I, I expect to uh, continue breakfast at about this reduced level going forward. That's still, yeah. that's still more than one a week. No, it's a huge number. And, and the fact that you said it was 300 is kind of mind blowing. I want to just dig in this a little more. So, so when you write social media, do you mean Facebook, Instagram, and Zoom, or do you mean Zoom? No, I mean, I've just recently started posting on Facebook. I have a guy helping me do that. I try to post periodically on LinkedIn, and I'm trying to build my network on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is in there. Facebook is in there. I don't do any of the other uh, social media platforms like, you know, internet or uh, Twitter. So I'm just Facebook and, uh, and um, LinkedIn and then Zoom and email. I email a lot. Got it. So the bulk of bulk, so with social media that, that encompasses individual emails you're writing, right. individual posts on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and it includes Zoom conversations. Right. And, and phone calls is in there as well? Yep. Okay. Yeah, uh, we, we often in digital marketing mean something a little different by social media. We think more about LinkedIn yeah. and, and, and Facebook. So it's helpful to see that. The, the other question I have is, is why breakfast? Like why, uh, why do you kind of put so much emphasis on having breakfast with people besides the fact that it's cheaper? Well, let's start with number one, it's cheaper. <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, if you see dinner, it's a good dating strategy too. Dinner, you know, typically runs a hundred buck, a hundred bucks if it's just two of us, right? And if the other, if they bring somebody else, this number could jump significantly. Here, we're talking 20, 20 bucks per meeting, right? So it's cheaper, uh, it's faster. I mean, I don't need to spend more than an hour. They don't need to spend more than an hour. Uh, I can almost everybody will agree to do a breakfast meeting because it's before they get jammed up during the day. And I'll meet at any time you want. If you want to meet at 6.30, I'll meet you at 6.30. You want to meet at 8.30, I'll meet you at 8.30. So it's convenient, it's short, it's inexpensive, it's informal. So it's not like uh, I'm showing up at their office 
while their phone is ringing or people are butting in on them, or I'm not expecting them to come to my home office, which in the case of, uh, you know, the question we had earlier about women networking, you know, no woman's going to want to come to my home for a breakfast meeting. So, you know, I think breakfast for a networking meeting. So I think there's all kinds of advantages to breakfast meetings. Normally I'm done by nine o'clock and the rest of my day is wide open. Perfect. Okay. So um, we, we have, a, uh, I think we can go another five minutes or so. I'm sure yeah, you have I'm almost, I'm almost done. Perfect. The, the only reason I mislabeled this social media is because I wasn't clever enough to figure out how to uh, pick a different title and jam it into the space for the column. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> nothing more, nothing more com complicated than that. Got it. So, what's the result of how I think I'm going to network after COVID nineteen, which is the way I'm doing it now? I'm going to make over fourteen hundred personal connections a year. About a hundred and five of those are going to be in person. So, let's say I'm, you know, the normal work week is, um, I don't know. 300, 300 days a year or something. Uh, that means I'm going to be meeting in person once every three days with somebody. I'm to be devoting 20 man weeks per year to selling. Even though in my own businesses or companies I've run, I've worn multiple hats from worrying about producing the product to managing the people to uh, doing a better job of purchasing things. Selling has to be an important part of what I'm doing. So if I'm spending 20 man weeks a year selling, I think that's about the right priority at a minimum. I'm spending $2 in about an hour and a half on average per business development contact. I mean, I think that's incredibly efficient. And I'm adding at least 500 new relevant contacts per year to my database. And I, I, I absolutely assure you, I generate a huge multifaceted ROI from networking this way. Uh, huge benefits for me personally, huge benefits career-wise, huge benefits for my company, huge benefits for my family. Our son is 36 years old. He's only had two jobs since he got out of college. I networked him to both of them, the first one at Deloitte and the second one where he's been for the last 12 years. He's never looked for a job because of my networking. That, that's a huge advantage for, for kids of people on this call. So what do I suggest you do in the next 90 days? Ramp up your random networking, start talking to everybody, every place all the time. Improve your LinkedIn profile, post monthly on LinkedIn, target to add at least five to 10 minimum new contacts a week to your database. Do things to boost your brand. Pick out groups and events to either join or create. And I underline create because I much rather create my own groups and my own events as a way to chum. Set your sales goals and link those goals to specific target contacts. Make contact and build relationships, not focus on the transactions. And I think you're going to close more sales. What are some of the results of my developing networking skills. I've really boosted my confidence. I went from when I had to quit McKinsey because I lacked the confidence to maybe become a partner to now I have no problem meeting anybody, taking on any kind of challenge. You know, I may not win every, every battle, but I certainly feel confident taking on any battle. I've led a pretty exciting life with great experiences. I've met and learned to relate to amazing people including three presidents of the US. Uh, I've had a fair amount of business success so far, although I still think I got a long way to go. I've impacted and coached thousands of others of varying ages from young kids up to uh, senior citizens to develop their networking skills to help them enrich their lives. I've certainly have created lots of opportunities for my family and my friends, and it, and it certainly kept me younger because it keeps me on the ball going all the time. I wake up in the morning excited to challenge the day. So here's a copy of the book that I wrote. Gets very good reviews on Amazon. And I would love to uh, have separate one-on-ones with anybody on this call 
and look for synergies. I'm sure we're going to find them and develop a relationship and see, uh, and see what good things we can create together. I think, uh, you know, one of the keys to your life is leveraging friendships and alliances, you know, to really gain leverage in the things you're trying to accomplish. You can't accomplish much on your own. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Absolutely. Um, Jack, I had a, I wanted to take a, a few more minutes before we wrap up to, sure. to dig in uh, to, to, a, um, to a breakfast. So, sure. okay, you, you don't need to share your screen anymore uh, if you don't want. Um, so let's say you've scheduled a breakfast with someone who you want in your network. Um, how do you prepare for that breakfast? Uh, depends. Depends uh, if it's a first time meeting. Yeah, uh, this is a, this is a new contact, someone who you think could be valuable to you, or someone who you want to meet for what whatever reason. Uh, first of all, I probably spend an hour doing my homework on them. I go to LinkedIn, I check them out. I might Google them. I I check out their company. I learn as much as I can about them. Uh, I try to learn a little bit about the industry. So. I, let's say I spend an hour doing my homework and then uh, I might occasionally, I might put together a written uh, agenda of things I want to cover with them. No more than one page, all bullet points. What do I want to learn about them? You know, something about their, their business development strategy or their customer, who's their target customer. I get them talking mostly about them. So I can begin to find ways to add value to them if it's possible for yeah. me to do that. And so it's, it's really 90% of me probing them. And I might have two or three bullet points about me. You know, I might have a, about street smart entrepreneurs started six months ago. The purpose is to help drive entrepreneurship globally. We're going to do that by developing online courses, doing strategic consulting maybe creating an incubator, maybe even creating a fund down the road, maybe even creating an entrepreneur's TV show. So stuff I can cover in five minutes, but I want to get them talking. And then I, if in, in a lot of cases for first time meetings, I'll put together what I call a leave behind, which is a little one page note that says, uh, you know, these are the type of new contacts that I would value and would appreciate. And I might put down entrepreneurs starting a business or entrepreneurs running a business or board members or whatever, whatever it is at the time. And it varies from each of my different career paths that leave behind in the horse industry would be totally different than what it is now. And then down at the bottom of that note, I say, now, please follow up this meeting by emailing me uh, bullet points are the kind of contacts that you would value. So I know how to follow up with them. So I think just having a one page leave behind that pinpoints what you're looking for and really emphasizes to get them to send you what they're looking for. And it's a nice way to wrap up the hour over eggs. And that one page leave behind is literally not a follow up email or anything. It's literally a printed sheet. This printed sheet, I give it to them at the table at the diner. Nice. I walk them through it so they understand why I'm giving it to them. And what you're generally asking for is for them to put you in touch with people in their network. Yeah, if, the, if they see some way that somebody in their network would be interested in any of the things I'm doing. Um, and, and while you're talking to them, are you looking for, is one of the biggest ways you add value is connecting them Conversely, with people in your network, sure, or or whatever, yes, yeah. So yes. It's, it's almost like the 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 currency in this interaction is your network and his network or her yeah. network is is it's relationships. Yeah, it's like exchanging relationships, right? So but, it's really. You know, I'm sorry. It's so 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 you're looking for ways to help them often by putting them in touch with people in your network and your ask for them often is for them to put people in touch 
in touch right. with you people in their network. Right. But I always emphasize, you know, before you start putting me in touch with good people in your network, you know, make certain that you really feel comfortable, that you know enough about me. I think a big mistake that people make is asking for referrals when they haven't built up a base of trust with the people that they're trying to get the referral from. Yeah. Uh, when I teach people how to network, I get into a whole management system for managing the referral process. And it all starts with building a trust-based relationship. Perfect. So, so um, I, I almost undersell getting contacts. I'm not saying, you know, by next Friday, put me in touch with some of these. I'm telling them, look, these are the people I value trying to get to meet, but let's spend some time getting to know each other. So you really understand what I'm doing. You feel comfortable uh, put me in touch with good people, you know, and as we're doing that, I'll get to feel comfortable and I'll be, get a better understanding of the people that really I know that could help you as opposed to sending them the junior varsity contacts just to fulfill what might be an obligation. I'd rather send them the varsity contacts. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jack. I just wanted to quickly uh, talk about what we have coming up before we wrap up for today. Um, so next week, uh, we're going to have 10 free strategies for internet marketing with the amazing uh, Jay Berkowitz, uh, founder and creator of 10 Golden Rules. Uh, we're also going to be talking the week following, next uh, two Wednesdays from now, about seven ways to supercharge your customer retention uh, with Patrick Neff, uh, who works with Toyota. Um, and again, wanted to encourage you to uh, sign up at one, in one swoop for all of our upcoming webinars through our season pass. Uh, and also please consider our uh, five-week accelerated course in digital marketing. Uh, this is the link uh, to apply for a scholarship, try.bizhack.com slash scholarship. And then finally, our parting thought for today, network all the time, everywhere, with everybody, the title of Jack's book. Jack, uh, thank you so much for yeah. taking the time today and for your incredible advice. Really appreciate it. Yep, Dan, I, I think I have some other good people to suggest would be good speakers for your program. So ah. I'd be happy to connect you. I love it. Could you hand me the one pager? Uh, I wish we were at coffee right now. Right, right. So uh, I'll, get, I'll get back to you with some names. Th thank you very much. I love, I love that. You, you know, I think that's a, a beautiful way to end. It's a beautiful example of how, how Jack works. He's always looking to provide value and, and, and give. Um, and the value that you're going to give is not only to help me, uh, but also to help those speakers. So right. um, you're, you're here because of Richard Shapiro and yep. you're paying it forward. Yep, absolutely. I love it. Perfect. Well, Andrea, Andre, Armando, Ashley, Audrey, Carl, Charles, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, Christine, Darren, great to see you. Fanny, a good speaking to you earlier this week. George, Jane, Jason, a lot of folks who are part of our uh, current program. Really appreciate having you. Uh, Jonah, Jose, Judy, uh, Kim, Kimberly, Milu in Argentina, Natalie, one of our newest coaches and instructors. Uh, great to have you here. Great to have you part of the team. Pauline, Praveen, Rachel, Samantha, Terry, great to see you as always, Victor Lee, Victor Maxwell, and Zanat. Thank you guys all so very much, and we'll see you in a week. Yeah, thanks, Thank everybody. You. Bye, Jack. Thank you. Yep, yeah, thanks. Take care, everybody.